This will be, and now for something completely different. For those of you who are British, you might expect in a comic show after this sentence, but I promise to be very serious. Only it would be about statistics, and therefore a slightly different flavor from the morning. Uh, in these uh, recent years, in the sense 10 or 20 of them, we have unfortunately had quite a lot of pandemic threats with, uh, you, you can try to remember all the SARS and bird flus and swine flu and the Ebola and uh, now the new coronavirus. They're all pandemic threats and what they have in common from our point of view is that uh, people very quickly from the early date on the spread, which then also increases because people see an epidemic coming, want to make inference about the basic parameters of the disease. And therefore, it's a problem field in itself. Can there be any statistical problems if you try to estimate parameters in the early phase of a disease when the thing is still growing in an epidemic fashion in some part of the world? And uh, this is about that. It's in collaboration with Tom, which is somewhere here, but he's responsible for many of the things. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that later. And this is just to warm up a little bit. Namely, statisticians are a little bit sensitive about data because not all data is, are what, or is, I don't know, what they seem to be. Depends on how you sample them. And here is just a small example that if you look at things in the beginning of an epidemic, but this is in a theoretical fashion, then things are not exactly what you expect. This is a branching process which has the reproductive number 1.5, very simple with Poisson generations. And you uh, simulate this thing many, many times with the only restriction that you're only interested in those instances where the thing grows, becomes an epidemic. Because you know that the branching process can also die out. But if in practice something dies out, you don't call it a pandemic threat. So this is when it grows, simulated many, many times, and then one looks at how big are the successive generations in this process. And then what you expect is, of course, if I succeed, this series, which are the powers of 1.5, power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, these are powers of 1.5. But instead, you see that the means of the process are much higher, or much higher, they are higher. And the first one, you can kind of calculate the 2.12, by saying that this fact that the thing should explode will change the average number that the first guy must have as progeny because it must be a little bit larger than usual in order to take, be part of the exploding trajectories. But the thing goes on in a strange way because then you see the successive means, they are still larger than the 1.5 powers that they should be. But the factor that differentiates the 1.5 powers from the real means seems to converge to something. And that comes from the theory of branching processes that there will be a multiplicative factor in front of the exponential, which is one over the probability of explosion. So you can kind of, this is a very stochastic thing. A determinist would not see this because it's a stochastic phenomenon that you have different probabilities for two kinds of trajectories. But this is not what I'm going to talk about. So I will now move on to the serious stuff, which is that when you have these pandemic threats and you want to analyze the early phase of an epidemic, then usually, People concentrate on R0, which is the central parameter, at least to start with. And they use rather simple models. And in simple models, you have two relations that are useful. One is this Euler-Lotka equation that says that if you combine the exponential rate of increase in the beginning, called little r, 
and the generation time distribution and R naught, you should have this relation. It comes from demography, but that's the classical relation between these three quantities. And usually you can observe the rate of increase because you just look at cases. And then you usually try to estimate that G function. And then you say you can estimate R naught. Another way of estimating R naught is to use this interesting equation, not as it looks, but usually discretized in weeks or days. This is the kermack mckendrick original model, which was formulated as a renewal equation instead of differential equations. It reduces to differential equations if you make this generation time distribution exponential, then it can be transformed into a set of differential equations. But this is really a renewal thing for the incidence. How many people will get the disease as new infected now depends on those who have got it previously times a factor which is the generation time distribution again. And so discretizing this and knowing the incidence and knowing well that you're in the start, so this quotient is one, and assuming that you start with one individual and knowing G, you can estimate R naught. That's the, the theory that is very often used to estimate R naught from these initial data. But this is two problems with estimating the generation time distribution in the beginning of the epidemic. One is that the generation time distribution itself is usually thought of or defined as that lapse of time between the moment one person is infected and that person infects another person. And then that can vary and that's the distribution. Now, moments of infection can rarely be observed in people. And therefore, the first thing is that usually a pro... Sorry, it was the wrong button. Uh, usually, you observe a proxy for this, which is called the serial interval, which is instead between when the first person gets symptoms and the second person gets symptoms. And the idea is that since those two things are more or less of equal length, the interval between them is the same. So you can substitute serial intervals for generation intervals or whatever. And the second one is that how do you see these intervals anyway? Well, usually you start from somebody infected, finds out that he had contact with somebody else who you now know is also infected, and you say, okay, that must be the infector, so that's a generation time. And so you have backward. Contact tracing is essentially backwards in time. Okay, that's how you get your data. Next slide, please. Uh, so Tom and I started thinking about this from a statistical point of view because it has been for some time now studied in various ways that this generation time, when you look at it in a stochastic version of epidemics, has strange properties. It gets distorted, it gets changed by when you look at it. If you look at it in the beginning of the epidemic, at the peak of the epidemic, or during some intermediate time. And the fact is that if you look at it in the beginning of the epidemic, the generation times are generally shortened according to the models, compared to what their distribution should be. And the reason is demographic. There are, since the epidemic is growing exponentially, there are plenty of people who have been infected recently, and so there are too many young infectors around when somebody else gets infected. And so short times will suddenly dominate because of the presence of these young or recent infectors. But you can, that becomes mathematics after a while, and you can show how this shortening appears. And so looking at what the effects of this is, that's the arrow implication, one is our paper. One can show <laughs> that <laughs> One can show that this shortening of the, the observed generation times, if you use that distribution that you see, together with the formula that we saw on the previous slide, then you always tend to underestimate R0. You, you get the solution, of course, with the distribution you have, 
but it tends to underestimate R0. Is that serious or not? Well, you can judge here. We, we did a little example. This paper came out in the Ebola time, really, I mean, the thoughts behind the paper came out because of Ebola, because the same kind of exercise was done. But now we have more or less fresh data from the new coronavirus disease, which has now changed name. I mean, you all observe here that it's now called COVID-19 is the disease, and the virus is now called SARS-CoV-2. But anyway, a couple of weeks uh, ago, an early paper came out, Chinese paper of Li at various people, and they had some data. The exponential rate of increase of cases had been measured, and the serial intervals, as we said, had also been measured in a certain number of people that they had been able to contact trace. And if you look at the theory that one can develop about the difference between the observed generation times and the true distribution, and assuming a little bit on the shapes of distributions that are involved, we chose gamma because they have so nice integrals. Uh, then you can even uh, write out a formula for what the biasing factor will be, how much shorter the R0 will be than the real one according to the model. So what R0 should be multiplied with? This is an, the expression. And it turns out to be, in the practical case, 10 to 12 percent with these data. 10 to 12 percent. So it's a, it's a difference. It's not enormous, but it's a kind of bias that will arise if you do this way without correcting for the fact that you have been backward observing serial intervals instead of generation times, the true generation times. Now, since it's about estimating interesting things in the beginning of the epidemic, we also looked at some other things that people like to estimate or some other problems that arise when estimating them. And there are two interesting problems that I would like to mention. Yes, I would like to mention them. Uh, one is the multiple exposures problem, and that's a practical one. When you do this contact tracing, you usually find one pe person with the symptoms. And then you uh, try to figure out who can that person have encountered in the past that infected him. And as soon as you have that one, then you can compute the interval between, say, symptom appearance in the two people. But uh, sometimes you find that that person in the past has met several people who later have turned out to be infected. And so you're not really sure which one of these infected that index person. And so that's a kind of survival data analysis problem. You have a measurement of duration, but you're not sure where the beginning is. You know where the end is, <laughs> but not the beginning. And that's not really standard in survival data analysis. So that's what the multiple exposure problem is. Another one, counting delayed events, I'll tell you afterwards. I'll start with the multiple exposures. So if you start thinking about it, if you had three candidates for the start of this period, and here's the end point, you could have different strategies. You could choose the nearest one, the, further, the farthest one, uh, an average of the three times, whatever. You could have various strategies in choosing one start point, but when you reason about it, all of these will give some bias compared to the true one, because you don't know which the true one is. So what we came up with is a procedure for, at least in theory, correctly doing inference in this situation, which contains a part of what would be an epidemic process, because what we say with this likelihood contribution that each index case will give is that compared to the possible start points of the interval and the end point, so these are possible durations, this is a model distribution for the distribution of times. Then we simply say that since that person met potential infectors, each time that person could have been infected with a certain probability or escaped infection with a certain probability and was infected after a kind of geometric series of attempts and sooner or later got infected, of course. And so the weights for these different durations should have this geometric form. 
at least in a kind of partial likelihood thing. Why do I say partial? Because here there's no explanation why he met the infectors at those time points. The process of meeting is not included here. It should be included. But since that probably doesn't have very much to do with the duration of his serial time or whatever it is, one can hope that already inference on this partial piece of likelihood will give sufficient information on H. Our purpose is estimating H here. The so, the, what? One is the first and the K is the last thing. Yes, they, the E's are ordered in, time, in real time order so that you can say so you one. Can the first they, one they, and they, the most recent one. Yes, yes, they are ordered in real time so that this kind of geometric model makes sense. Uh, did the first one infect him or not? Did the second one, etc., infect him or not? Well, then these, these times here will also be ordered, I mean. Uh, okay. Now, how do you know that such a method will get good results? Well, if nothing else, you can simulate it. And so we simulated, and it shows up that you can estimate, if you give a parametric form to H, and uh, you then estimate the parameters of H and P, you don't even have to know it beforehand, you can estimate these apparently consistently, but there's nothing strange about them. They're just three parameters in maximum likelihood. So in reality, with a lot of data, you should have consistent estimators of the parameters in this model. And in fact, it seems to work, but it doesn't work well if you're wrong about the parametric form of H. I mean, we simulated data with one distribution and then tried an other H form, like log normal and gamma, for instance. And then, then things went wrong. But then, if you just assume a little bit about the process of encountering people now, which is not modeled, but uh, hope that it is Poisson-like or something, then you can, in fact, think out a number of moment equations that you can use for moment estimations. And so you can, anyway, get consistent estimates, hopefully, of the average, the standard deviation of the distribution that you're interested in and of the p-value just by moment estimators or moment equations. And those work well under whatever distribution you're using because the equations themselves assume no distribution and the data come from some distribution that has average and standard deviation. So that goes well instead. Anyway, that was that problem, which is in practice encountered very often, and people usually solve it by some rule. Let's take the nearest infector, let's take the fir first one or something. But in fact, this is one of the first presumably theoretically correct methods to handle this multiple exposures problem. In the Ebola, in the Ebola case, they sorted by throwing away all the Yes, they, they selected only persons who had one in possible infector. So they Hopefully, so. 75% of the data, uh, and the result was that they kept only ones with one. Yes. And that's a bias in itself. Yes, if you think about it, everything you do goes wrong almost. If you just select people who have one possible infector, so must have been infected by the first infector they met. The fact of only having one means that their time to symptom was so short that they didn't have time to meet another one. And that selects for extra short times. So statistically, that was wrong also, I mean, unfortunately. But this might be correct. It still uh, is a kind of, yes? Is there no correlations about your predecessors? Do you assume that they're all independent? Right? Independently effective, but if they are now correlated, Yes, but no, th th this is still ideal in the sense that you imagine a series of kind of contacts with different persons and each time you have this probability of being infected or not. So this is not a good model for your household contacts, for instance. It's a good model for contacts outside uh, where you meet different people and they try to infect you. And, uh, but one could try to think about this kind of models also for household where have some kind of continuous exposure, but you would have to figure out how to model uh, being continuously exposed to somebody in the household. 
Or you could also say that you have different contacts with different people if you get to know about it and have two different P's for close contacts and far away contacts. But depends on how much information you have in each case, uh, who were the possible infectors, etc. But it at least it's a way of thinking that allows you to use all the data in some kind of model that um, reflects something. If there's no light here, that's a bad sign. Yes? Okay. Now, counting delayed events is instead a kind of simple activity. You imagine that there's a series of events within a time window that you observe. And that's usually time from the beginning of the epidemic until the day you decide to do the analysis or you collect data. But you're not interested so much in the primary event or it's you are interested in them, but you don't see them. But you see a delayed version of each event, which comes later on according to some distribution. A typical case is, of course, the one illustrated here, that uh, you have, for instance, either people getting infected and then at some later point dying, or people getting symptoms, which you observe. So you have the times of when they get symptoms. That's usually what's referred to as the cases in your early epidemic, and then they die after some delay and with some probability. That probability is interesting. If I go from symptoms to death, that would be the symptomatic fatality rates. If I also knew what percentage of people are symptomatic, I could multiply or divide or whatever, and I would have the total fatality rate. But this one is kind of observable. The problem is that since I have a time window, I will see how many get symptoms in my window, but not how many of these die, because they might die after my time window. So there's a censoring problem. But that's not the only problem. You can also show that the fact that the number of cases and the number of symptomatic whatever is incre exponentially increasing will give you some modification of the distributions that are in the middle of things. And if you develop these ideas once again, you get this little nice compact formula that you observe a kind of quotient. This might, for instance, be how many have died within T, how many have had symptoms within T. And everybody almost in the epidemiology department knows that that is too small because you haven't seen all deaths yet associated with those who have had symptoms. But in this increasing model, the epidemic, epidemic, R, and with some distribution function, which would be the time between having symptoms and dying, and P being the proportion who will have this event of dying, then this quotient will very quickly approach this thing. And since you want to estimate the P, then you just have to calculate the integral and divide your estimate with the integral. And then you have a corrected version. And this is also more a way of thinking, because everybody, or almost everybody, knows that this quotient is biased downwards, because you have missed some of the people who will die in the future. But once again, in an Ebola paper, they came up with a solution. Let's only look at people who have done something during zero T. So some people have got well, and some people have died. So everybody that we look at has a definite outcome, either well or die. But then going along this line of thoughts, you discover that even using data only from these people who have a definite outcome in zero T, you get things wrong if the two distribution functions, one for the time from symptoms to getting well, and the other one from getting symptoms to dying, which will maybe different, if they are different, you still get a consistent bias in your estimate. So this little formula is in theory useful, at least for correcting things for exponential growth and for censoring. The censoring cannot be seen in this formula because it essentially appeared up here in the integration interval instead of infinity. But since it's about a kind of exponential thinning of a distribution function, very quickly the thing converges to a number and that's it. That's why it now says infinity. But the T is there somewhere. And then finally, that's it.
Thank you. I know that this was statistics, but some questions. Uh, well, uh, Andrea. Okay, you were uh, just uh, to go back. You need to. I mean, how do you estimate age of S, the time to death, when you have uh, only limited data? Because perhaps you have still a bias distribution of that as well. If, in the if you were interested in this latest uh, age of S, so from symptoms to death, you're supposed to have patients who you know when they had symptoms, and then you follow them and they die. In theory, you would have to correct them also for exponential growth because those that have had symptoms near to the time limit and have died will have selectively closed things. So you have to make some corrections in the estimate of age. But in theory, this is observable by looking at some cases who have gone from symptoms to death and then maybe correcting also for this eat. The same correction as the generation times essentially have to maybe go back in some recent cases that have short times if they are within your time interval. And the same thing for, for being well. I mean, you also have to wait until somebody gets well and then maybe correct for the latest one who got well too quickly. So, so I have a question. One of the, okay. Yes? Oh, all right. Uh, so, so my question was, would it be possible to take into account the distribution of your uh, intervals by, say, introducing some kind of Bayesian structure into your model that you're using to, to, to do the, the, the estimation. So basically, if you would introduce a probability distribution that governs, uh, say, the either generation interval or, or, the, or the serial interval, that will give you some idea about how to handle potentially the heterogeneity that, that you're observing. That's sort of yes. often the trick that people who know yes, Bayesian it, methods mm, mm. apply. Yes, no, but um, I have nothing against Bayesians. I mean, I come from the country right now with Definetti <laughs> and everything, so we have to live with that. No, the problem is that whatever inference method you use, even Bayesian, your observed data will represent another distribution than the one you're aiming for. So even in the Bayesian sense, you'll get a biased uh, a posteriori because it's not about the real distribution you want, but about something else. I because understand, yeah. Hmm. But, but, but my, my point is that it might be a, you, you might be able to decrease or at least alleviate this bias if you will introduce this, this notion of variability with, within your uh, serial interval. Variability. I don't know, because in Bayesian analysis, at some point, data wins against whatever Bayesian first approach you have. So with enough of these biased data, you would still get the wrong distribution. So I'm not talking about... But the... you mean the variability. So, so what I mean is that you would introduce a structural Bayesian model. So you're not putting a prior distribution on your parameter. You're basically saying that your parameter is governed by a probability distribution of it... which parameters you would be estimating. Now, it's easier than... Let's see if I can make this work. It's easier than that in the sense that, at least in theory, but I admit that um, it's, uh, it's a kind of simple theory because it comes from the SIR model, then the kind of distribution that you will be looking at in the beginning when there is exponential increase, instead of being this GS, which is the one you want, will be this expression, R naught e to the minus RS GS. That's the bias distribution that you're seeing. So in theory, you have a formula for it. And so you could take data, say, I have now estimated R to the R naught e to the minus RS GS, and now I invert this and get a corrected estimate of G. That is possible, but it's, it's not a completely easy thing because mm -hmm. You have to think statistically now, not to divide by two small things and whatever. So how to make that correction is not clear in the best possible way. But that's the form of the bias in a simple model. So you know how it looks. It has been exponentially downweighted in the tail. And that's why it's also shorter. So 
yes, you could start from that and say, I will now pick out the correct G by correcting for this uh, thing. But you have to have R naught, for instance. Well, at right. least you can you can normalize to one. So anyway. The... So, so, so let, let me just make one more comment. So I think what I'm saying is that you might be able to do this correction by introducing some parameterization, effectively parameterizing your G function by something that would be easier Yes, oh. yes, you can do that, and that, that's what we have done now and then to get some nice short formula. If you take G to be a gamma for, to start with, then thing, this thing integrates well and just changes the gamma parameters in various ways, and you can kind of easily show how things will change, how much shorter the mean will be, how much this and that will happen. If you, for instance, work in the gamma family, because E to the minus RS times the gamma is nice. Yes? That's a good question I was asking about these generation functions. Why, why is gamma, why is, why is there something more known? What is more, most realistic? Whether it's a gamma or a normal or whatever? No. Or it can be computable? Uh, yes. In the sense that no, nobody knows. I mean the observed Yes, no, no, nobody knows about this, what these distributions are in a natural way. So gamma is a convenience family that kind of can look in various ways, but you could have chosen viable, I guess, you could have chosen whatever. Gamma makes the nicest formula. Uh, but... They are completely different. One is a long-term probability distribution, one is an exponential... Yes, yes, the, the, there can be differences in the families you choose, but we, we know very little, and especially we will know very little in the beginning of an epidemic because we don't have many observations. So we will be forced, I guess, to have some parametric model in the beginning of an epidemic. Because although, for instance, let's say 1,000 people or 2,000 people have been infected, the contact tracing about the times usually involves 20 people or 30 people or 50 people. So we don't have large samples of these numbers for the fit of the distribution. Is, is there an argument if you say, well, probably it's Markovian, then that is some of Markovian I, I don't know of any argument that would say how long does it take from symptoms to dying or how long does it take until something like that happens that has any natural mechanism. So, no, I admit that the families will be convenience families and you hope that they are reasonably stable in inference about means and things. <laughs> I just have two questions. I'm curious about the, the geometric component of the likelihood you showed, because it seems like the P should be a function of the time between the onset of symptoms in the infectee and the onset of symptoms in the possible infector. And the other question I have is, where, where does the infectious period fit into all of this, the relationship hmm. between the infectious okay. period and the okay. generation or serial so, interval distribution? Um, first, the P, no, the P is just thought of when you meet uh, an infected person, will you be infected or not? It does not depend. Of course, if you had more information, I met one person and I stayed with him for 12 hours, I met another one just for five minutes, then maybe you could imagine two different P's for short and long contacts, and then try a model with two different P's if you know this information. So this is, once again, just an idea how you could manage these things with more details as well. But right now, no, this is just thought of. If you meet somebody, there's a probability that you get infected, otherwise not. You go to the next one, see if you get infected, etc. And that's what this thing shows. The infection period, yes, that happened sometimes 15 years ago, when suddenly this Euler-Lotka equation, that one, became popular as a way of estimating R0 because that one uses the generation time. And since then, generation times have been the aim of many estimation exercises. But the generation time itself is made up in symbol models by the latent period plus a part of the infectious period. So of course you can express it in terms of the latent one and the infectious one. But these two components have kind of been lost when you instead are on the lookout for the generation time, which is a compound. The generation time distribution, furthermore, might contain also variations in infectivity and whatever you want during your infectious period. Uh, 
And that's why right now I think most many people think that generation time is a superior measure of what how the infectious process goes on compared to giving separate pieces. I'm not really convinced that this is the best way. I still think that getting the pieces separately is quite useful. Infectious period, latent period, or whatever. Infectivity during the infectious period. But right now, generation times are a compound of all these things. And that's why they, they are popular, because they have this one simple relationship. Thank you very much. I think Thank you. We can.